Okay, as usual, we will start with our Q&A for the TOEFL question for lesson six. So if you have any question, please just uh, use our night group to write down your, uh, this one. Okay, so we will use our night group to accept your quest. <coughs> so we have two questions so far. <coughs> if you have any more, just uh, pop it out. Okay, guys, okay, that's uh, have our first one. And let's go to uh, number 28. Number 28 first. Okay, let's see this one. Can we say that someone is authorized to, if you have a uh, authorized to investigate, so this should be a verb, not a noun, right? So it's very straightforward. So just be careful. When you want to use to verb to investigate, okay? Of course, to can be an infinitive. Uh, the other one is a preposition. So uh, this one is an infinitive. So we have to use a verb followed with to. So let's move to 36. It's just on the right. So you see the mechanism of human thoughts and records. Of course, we have to identify the structure first, right? So uh, the mechanism is the subject. And a subject is the, a positive for mechan mechanism. So altogether, this is a modifier to modify this mechanism. So mechanism of human thought and recall, this is the subject, so it is a positive, right? But basically, when we talk about subject, this is the subject here. This is a subject only, the core word for the subject. So subject is, this is a B verb, right? Complicated is an adjective, is a subject complement. So we need to have an adverb to modify adjective. So basically, it's extraordinarily. So we have to change this to become an adverb so that we can use the adverb to modify complicated. It means very, very, very complicated, right? Okay, for example, you are very smart. You are smart. Very is the adverb to, is a qualifier to modify smart. Uh, don't eat in the classroom, hello? Don't do that. Yeah, because you don't like to have a lot of cockroaches running down around your feet, right? So don't do that. Thank you very much. So it is a mandate requirement for all. Don't eat in this kind of classroom. If you want to go there, fine, but not here. Okay? Great. Okay, uh, so be careful. Uh, when you want to modify adjective, use adverb. Okay, we have a 38. So let's move down to 38. Okay. <coughs> so be careful of this. The group artichoke, the group artichoke was noun, okay, was noun. Artichoke was noun, that would be the end of the sentence. So as a delicacy is a prepositional phrase at least 2,500 years. Okay, and the records of it date back, not from. That back 15th century. So we have to use that. So as a date at least 200, uh, 2,500 years ago and uh, was known at that time. Okay, and the records of it, <coughs> cultivation date back to, okay, 15th century. So it's not, young, you cannot use from, okay, we have that back. We have to go back to that time. <coughs> and number 30. <coughs> number 
And be careful, when we say that, that back to the 15th century, if you identify a century, you need to use the. <coughs> so let's go to the number 30. Okay. <coughs> okay, the particle comprising a given crowd. So this is the particles. Particles is the subject, right? On continually changing. So it's changing by themselves. So you can use changing. As new ones are added, while others are taken away, not taken away. So something cannot be taken away because they cannot do the action. They must be taken away. So we use taken by moving air. And uh, 11, let's go up to 11. Okay, let's see this one. Where parallel computers perform groups of operation at the same time. So we have subject and we have a verb and we have the object, right? So basically this has complete the structure of the sentence. And over here, we need to have something like a dependent clause or adverbial phrase, right? So which one can take the place to make it become a dependent clause. Well, this one is the only choice. Whereas conventional computers handle tasks, tasks one after another. So where, whereas is a subordinative conjunction. So it leads a dependent clause. So this one is dependent. So parallel computing performs group operation at the same time. So remember, this is the answer we need. Okay, so let's move to 12. <coughs> okay, this one, uh, of course, we have to identify the, the Liberty Bell this is the this is the proper noun, so we have to use the whole components here. This is subject was moved to a separate glass pavilion in 1976. So this is a complete structure, right? But this is a modifier to explain, give, giving to give more information about the Liberty Bell that is <coughs> formerly housed in Dependence Hall. So which was, okay, so we just take away which was, we can eclipse this. And now in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia it's, we need to find something that can be used to provide additional information for Independence Hall. It can be a noun or an adjective, right? Because we need to uh, modify Independence Hall. So this one, a historical building in Philadelphia. It can be used to modify Independence Hall. Okay, so that, that's number 12. And number 22. This is uh, very interesting because when we use more, then we need to use more than. More than 90% of the people of in Indian, Indiana lived rural, lived in rural areas. This is another wrong here, it should be lit, lived in, not lived. Lived is not a transitive verb. But more than 90% of the people of Indiana Indiana lived in rural areas, which only a few cities having, with only a few city having a population is having a population is used to modify cities, so there's no problem. 
So basically, we have two. This is a typo. Um, but the, the wrong answer is this one, more than. Now, I want to ask you one question. That is a very intriguing. This, in this sentence, in sentence question number two, Okay, I want you as a roll call here. You just uh, type in your answer. Question number twenty-two. So, what is the what is the the subject? Okay, you have to provide your answer because this is also served as a uh, roll call. Okay, I'm going to end the roll call in 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, if we scroll down from all the answers, and uh, I'm not surprised to find out none of you are right. None at all. None of you, because over here, the answer is more. More is a pronoun. Okay, it is a pronoun. So more than is a preposition. So then 90% is a prepositional phrase. Of the people of Indiana is also a prepositional phrase. So basically, over here is to modify, is to provide answers to what, what's more. So this is more than. So remember, more is indeed a pronoun. <laughs> so more is a noun, pronoun. So it is the subject, OK? so. Not surprised because uh, it, it's it's very unusual to think, because in Chinese, in Chinese, our translation will be something, there yeah, more than this group of the people. So it's about the people, right? It's not about more. But for the English grammar, grammatical structure, more is the pronoun. So more is actually the subject. Strange, right? But it is the way. Okay, so in 1860, Mo lived in rural areas. Mo lived in rural areas. What kind of Mo? Then 90%. What kind of 90% are the people of Indiana? Okay, so this is the, what we need. Okay, so let's go back. Oops, oops. Let's uh, move up to, this is 22. And how about 21? Hmm? More is the subject. You can check it out, the speech of more. And you will surpri be surprised to find out it is a pronoun. <laughs> it can be a pronoun. More lived. More lived in rural areas. Okay, so the 13, the 13 stripes of the United States flag represent, so we have uh, 13, this is the subject, this is a subject, so there was no problem and represent the original 13 state of the union, right? So stripe represent states, and which this can be, you should obtain this one, which all were once colony of Britain. Okay, so this one should be taken away. Okay, let's move to 30. 
still confused? Okay. More than more than ninety percent of the people of Indiana, yeah. No, it is a noun. Yeah. Yes. And let let me clarify this. <coughs> Why you feel confused? Because you have to make sure about one thing. If a noun after the preposition, then it becomes a prepositional phrase. And the noun for the prepositional phrase is an object for the prepositional phrase. It cannot be the subject for the sentence. So basically, let's see this one. We have then 90%, right? This is the first prepositional phrase. Percent is not the subject. Of the people, another one, prepositional phrase, right? So it is an adjective, or adverb. Of Indiana is used to modify people. Of the people of Indiana used to modify percent. Then 90% of the people of Indiana is used to modify more. Yeah, you can say that, but not, th in this case, yes. But one thing for sure is that this, because this is a prepositional phrase, so this one cannot be the subject. And this is again a prepositional phrase, out. Of Indiana, prepositional phrase, right? It is out too. But this is only one more. So let's check it out. Check it out, the speech of the more. For more, and you will be surprised. <coughs> Let me use the uh, dictionary here. <coughs> Do you see this one? More is a pronoun. It's strange, but it is a pronoun. So look at here. More can be an, a determiner, can be an adverb, but it is also a pronoun. So more of the people refers to the more. What kind of more of the people? Okay, so it's a little bit confusing, but it is the right way to think. So remember, more is a pronoun. It can be singular or plural. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 right. More are happy. More students are happy to stay here. Or you can say more are happy to stay here. <laughs> I'm not so sure about whether you are happy or not, but uh, it's kind of challenging. But I, what we have done here is kind of, that will change your, your perception of our English. That is very strange, right? But it is true. More is a pronoun, so it is the subject, no doubt. Although the form is very strange, right? <laughs> It is strange, but more is indeed the subject. So come on, hurry up, change that. That's why I ask you what is the subject for the sentence. It can provide you some new insight. Okay, let's come back here where we were. Hmm? Oh, oh, okay, so we talk about 21, and uh, let's move down to 31. Okay. Well, basically, if we see political parties, this is the party subject, right? Okay. So help to help to organize, organ coordinate. That would be fine. If you want to say help coordinate, that is also okay, because two here can be omitted or not is fine. The campaign of their members and organize because party. Remember, party is, is a plural noun, right? So has to you. We need to follow it with help and organize, not as organize, not organizes. Okay, so we only use organize. Okay, then uh, let's move to 38. 38 here. Oh, we we'll have highlighted this already. And uh, number 16. 
Okay. So basically, a gene, this is the subject here, is a biological unit. So we are talking about unit of information, right? So we cannot use who. You always need to change it to that. Unit of information is not a person. So we need to change that to that. That directs the activity of a cell. And number 13, 13, 13, 13. 13 here. Okay, so the answer here, let, let's uh, go to identify the structure first. So fossils, of course, it is a subject, right? Fossils, and uh, there's a, a positive traces of that organism found in the rocks of Earth's crust. So basically, traces is a positive for fossil. And all of the other words here are the modifier to uh, provide more information about the traces. So basically, they are not important. We can take that out. So reveal, reveal, we need to reveal something, right? And something here, over here, we have to come out with a noun. This must be a noun. And we found out this were formed, the rock. The rock were formed is used to modify the time. So it's quite all right, but still, we still need to identify a component that can make it to become a, a noun, right? And so this is the answer, what life was like, what life, because we are talking about life. Fossil comes out from life, right? So number C. And uh, number, 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 17? 17, over here. <coughs> Okay. So basically, the flowering, the flowering is the, this one is the subject. The flowering of American African talent in literature, music, and art in the 1920s in New York City became known as the Harlem Renaissance. Became known. Because they are known. Because they cannot become to know something, right? Those subjects, those, the flowering movement is becoming known. They are passive. They cannot do the action of knowing, right? As they cannot do the action of knowing, so they have to be known by others. They have to, so they became, they become, became known. So that is not to know. Okay, and number 36, this will be, have uh, two minutes left. <coughs> oh, we are talking about this. It's extraordinary, already, right? Okay, we move up to 23. Okay. Uh, this is the sequence. We may want to change this. The other planets, not the planets, other of. Other is an adjective. Adjective should put in front of the noun to describe describe noun, right? So gravitation. Gravitation keeps something moon, keeps the moon in orbit around Earth, and the other planets of the solar system in orbit around the sun. Okay, we are so lucky today we can answer all the questions here. So let's have a 10 minutes break and we come back later. Okay, see you later.
Well, I hope that you have enjoyed your day over the weekend. Uh, the GP session is, <coughs> is a big deal for the students uh, in the Department of International Affairs. All of you have to, well, uh, you, are, you were sitting there yeah, uh, on Saturday, right? And you can imagine three years later, <laughs> you will be the one standing on the, uh, on the stage to defend your, uh, your paper and get grilled by the professor and maybe failed by those committee members. So enjoy, and this is a way of learning. And the process will be certainly difficult for some students. But even though you feel that is a kind of, uh, you can do it, you need to do it harder. Because um, the purpose of the GP graduation project is to train you to think independently. And uh, so that you can become an independent thinker and a, a person who can act upon your own problems, identify the problems, collect the data, and analyze the data and uh, solve your own problem. So you are a man, oh, I'm used the man in a generic sense, okay, human being, right? You are human. So you are capable of solving problems by yourself. Uh, uh, now you are leaving your home and uh, you are facing your academic career and uh, possibly in four years your future job. So what are you, what do you have prepared? All are determined by the remaining three and a half years a little bit more than that. Try a little bit harder, okay? So three years from now, it's your turn. I assure you, it's your turn. It, it will be fun, it will be fun. Okay, so today we move on to talk about the transition to the age of, um, of nationalism. Well, this, this is a very profound philosophical questions to all humankind. If we could live in an agrarian society, if we could just depend on ourselves, our family, our folks to uh, have another better day, then actually there's no need for us to form a society, let alone to form a nation to control us, right? So imagine this, we live in one nation, then there are a lot of obligations we need to fulfill. In Taiwan, you will need to report for military service. And you have to uh, go to school to study because this is compulsory education for before uh, 12 years. And uh, also you need to pay tax. You earn money, you cannot put all the money into your own pocket. You, ha you cannot keep those goals in your own cellar and it's feeling fine, feeling good. No, you have to pay tax. What's wrong with this? A lot of wrongs, right? Because government can corrupt. Nation cannot be fully protective of your interests. But still, now we are living in a nation. Why do we want to form a nation? Because there's a mentality for all the people to feel protected to feel belonged. And this is the process of getting nationalism to some extent. But nation, so today we want to talk about how we have transit ourselves from agrarian society to industrial society. Because of the emerging of the industrial society, so there's a strong need for us to become a member of the nation, of one nation. Le this kind of belonging mentality is very strong. And it's not simple just as, hey, hey, let's get together and form a state. No, it's, it's more than that. So today we will talk about something related to this. For of course, this is the rough outline for our lecture for today. We will talk about agrarian society, industrial society, and nationalism. And you can see this is a transition from the step one, agrarian society, and move up to become an industrial society. And today, and eventually evolved to the philosophy of, hey, we are a member, we are all members in one state. So you will, in Taiwan, you will sing national anthem, and in the United States, you will sing their anthems. 
national end. So every time we belong to something, national reason refers to a kind of ideology, right? Okay, so it comes out naturally from a smooth transition. And uh, after we have finished, we'll talk about something about English etymology and a sentence tenses one more time to tell you how to properly use timeline and action, po action points to understand the verb tenses you need to use. Eventually, we we'll talk about the assignments. Okay, so let's think about this. It's good to go back to an uh, agrarian society. You know, along throughout the time I become older, I become more longing for country life. I love to have a farm, and I love to have a small hill, and upon the top of the hill, I love to have a pavilion. Inside the pavilion, I prefer to have a table made by stone, and some chairs also made by stone. Other than that, I would like to have uh, one of my best friends in high school to play with you with me. Go, it's a black and white game, right? Have you ever heard about the game, Weichi? Yeah, I would like to invite him to come over to visit my small hill and uh, sitting in front of each other to play Weichi. Of course, m other than that, I would like to have uh, two dogs running around me and wife, my wife humbly <laughs> pour the tea for us. That would be great. And even greater is that uh, my grandsons were flying kites, flying kites upon the hill, right? That's uh, what a country life I have, right? If I could, I would really love to have this kind of life. And why do I love to have this? Because this belongs to my, my memory, it's part of my memory when I was young. When I was young, I lived in the countryside, and all the frogs, all the snakes, all the rice paddles, all filled with the fresh air, and you smell it, everything is so good. Nobody cares about you, nobody bothers you. All you can do is to depend on yourself, and you can still make a living and have a good life, right? So, basically, Agrarian societies belongs to many people's dream. <laughs> I, I say dream because here. The starting statement for this one is, the most important steps in the argument have been now being made. Made for what? This is a thesis statement for, the, for this article. Mankind is re irreversibly committed to industrial society, period. We have to commit to industrial society. So though I really had an uh, idea scenario what I would do after I retired from my professorship, a pavilion on the top of the hill, right? But gradually I found out that other than praying with Qi, I may still need to have a cell phone. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be out of the community so that would be strange. Modern modernity, right? Modern convenience is something I have to calm down, although I prefer the luxury leisure of being doing nothing. Just over there. So basically, can we go back to uh, agrarian society and say, I don't want to have live in an industrial society? Not a chance, folks, period, right? Okay, and therefore, so we have to accept this is the one thing, there's no point of return. Mankind is irreversibly uh, committed to industrial society. So in this case, and therefore a society whose productive system is based on cumulative science and technology. Okay, we live in industrial society and we need we need to count down the science and technology. So everything we have now, the amenity we have for our life is basically a product coming out of the accumulation of science and technology. So you can think about this. 20 years ago, uh, not 20 years ago, about 
some 16, 18 years ago, I worked in Washington, D.C. And I did have a very fancy cell phone. It's a Nokia. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of flip prop, right? It's very similar to today's uh, Samsung flip, but it's only much, much uh, inferior in terms of technology. So at that time, I used that one to make a lot of content for official businesses. And I walk on the street, I pop out my cell phone and then talk on the street. So fancy, right? But today, this kind of convenience is provided for all the human beings more than that. Why can we enjoy this kind of luxury? Science and technology. And it is not a one-time shop. It is accumulated, right? Okay, so let's look here. The industrial society alone, industrial society alone can do a lot of things for us. Basically, it can sustain anything like the present and anticipated number of inhabitants of the planets. We don't have to worry, unlike the previous lesson, we talk about the limited resources and the expanding human population, right? And you are quite sure about one thing. If we only follow with the classical economist approach, then people were getting more miserable generation after generation. But now we have another argument. Because we now live in an industrial society, so there's no problem. Because all the science and technology will be able to provide all things we need for all the human beings now and in the future. It doesn't matter how many people you have, right? Okay, so basically, because of this kind of mentality, we take for granted for a lot of things. That is, we could have a process of the kind of standard of living. We could at least live just with like we have now, right? So we take for granted for the, about this. We, we, we'll be fine, we'll be better off, and that is taken for granted by many people, or aspires to take them for granted. Take for granted. Aspires to and uh, take them for granted is a little bit different because you were aspired to take for granted. You are encouraged by some kind of propaganda, right? Oh, you'll be better off. Politicians always say that, hey, folks, vote for me and you'll be fine. Well, so you go to vote and uh, you have um, very nasty politicians always pressurize <laughs> with various, uh, from, from other sources. We don't know. So here comes the one solution. Uh, one statement here. Mankind committed to industrial society, period. Okay? And let's move forward to the next argument. So if we, move, if we have already moved into industrial society, but how about the agrarian society our forebearers have uh, lived in for more than centuries, century, decades, millenniums, we can say that, right? So let's see about, let's talk about something about agrarian society. Is that good? <sighs> Unfortunately, agrarian society is no longer an option. It's just not possible. You could have a farm, you could have a small homestead, but you cannot change the whole society into the agrarian society. Why is that? Because for its restoration, if we really change the current industrial society back to an agrarian society, then what would happen after that, that kind of change? This kind of restoration will simply condemn the great majority of mankind to death by starvation. So agrarian society is good, but there will be no food, no sufficient food. And those foods have been produced by modern science and technology, right? We could feed so many people today. It is because our scientists uh, scientific and technological uh, advancement that make the production possible. Is that right? Just like those neoclassical economies have always uh, promoted, that we have a new knowledge, we have a new technology, right? So we can do a lot of, the, the supply is elastic. 
But if we just go back to agrarian society, we have to count down our hands only, right? So in this regard, no food. So many people, no food. Then people die. So eventually we will have a balance, of course. We have a small food to support a small portion of the people. But how about the majority of the people? They will starve to death. Okay, and even you survived. Even you survive, you are so lucky you have some potato or yam hiding under your bed, you <laughs> can still survive more than the others. But you would encounter a dire and unacceptable poverty for the minority of the survivors. So even you survive, you are no better than those people who died. To some extent, you would wish you should have died already, right? Because that is a dire and unacceptable poverty. Have you ever experienced the, the so-called poverty, being poor, have you ever? I don't think you have, I don't think you have. Even myself, I don't. I did not have this experience because I was born in a not so poor family, I would say that. When I was young, all the mirror would always appear on the table on time, and uh, we have, uh, so I, I was not that poor, but I do know some people over there who were very poor in my age. Do you have the experience of collecting the soap crumb? You know, you will use soap, right? And uh, there are always a remnant crumb up there crust, skating around the bathroom. Uh, I knew someone who had collected all, the cr all of those crumbs together and uh, put them into a bowl, a soap bowl, and use it again. And even the soap bowl become a very small, tiny job. He should still <laughs> collect all the other jobs together to become a smaller bowl. Poverty. Time is different. I don't believe that any one of you, including myself, has similar experiences. But I did know someone who had these experiences, and that was her childhood experience at all. Not only, not only her, but also her peers, her, her neighbors, all the people over there. Time is different, right? But now, fortunately for us, you don't have to live this. But now, if we just simply move us to back to, let's ride the time machine and travel back to a agrarian society. Not only you, all people, I would say. <laughs> all people, eight billion people, just travel back to a agrarian society. When they landed on the old earth, 99% of them will die quickly. So agrarian society is a dream can be a dream, but not, cannot be a reality for now. Then there's no point. So because of this, because of this, you see this. There's no point in discussing. Hey, let's go back. No, no, you don't have to do. For any practical reason, purposes, the charms and the horrors of the cultural and the political accompaniments of the agrarian society. Don't tell me how good it was and how good it shall be. No, no, and no, because it's not possible, right? So, because they are simply not available. There's no point to go there. If something cannot, if something cannot be realized, it doesn't matter how much we talk about that, right? It cannot be realized at all. Because this kind of agrarian society, capable of supporting all humankind we have nowadays, is not there, not available, okay? So when we face industrial society, actually, we are living in right now, and but we have some kind of gap over there. That is, we do not properly understand the range of options available to industrial society. What can we have from this, uh, this new kind of society and how can we best use the best of it? We have no idea. And perhaps we never share. 
But we understand some of its essential commitments. If you want to live, if you want to live in an industrial society, you have to make some commitment. You have to accept some requirements over there. Although we do not know how much we can get from it, but we have to accept some commitment we need to make. Okay, for example, the cultural homogeneity demanded by nationalism is one of them. If you live in a nation, and uh, a nation is there in order to impose tax upon you, and uh, in order to uh, teach you, educate you as a member of the nation, then certainly you will go to school, right? And you go to school, accept education from the school, then you are socialized by the state. So after this kind of socialization, you become a member of the state, feeling belonged. If everyone inside the nation all feels belong to the state, then we found out that we are practicing the same cultural practices. So we call cultural homogeneity. So when we say Taiwanese, well, we have a perception, image about Taiwanese, right? And this kind of image about Taiwanese is a way, is a symbol of cultural homogeneity. Homogeneity is homo is same. Let me point out for you. Homo, basically it is the same. And the GN refers to kind. So when we talk about homogeneity, same kind. Just about the same kind, right? So in terms of a cultural practice, we are the same kind. So we have homogeneity. But how about different kinds? This is 同值的, 同值的名词. But how about hetero? So here, hetero, H-E-T-E-R-O, means different. Heterogeneity means of different kinds. So we have the same kind, homogeneity, and the heterogeneity, different kinds. Okay, so the kind of cultural homogeneity demanded by nationalism. If you in are in a one state, you have to belong in the same culture, or otherwise, or otherwise you will be discriminated, and uh, gradually you will be out of the from the mainstream of the society, and uh, gradually you will not belong to the same country. Everyone has to belong. In order to make you belong, then the, the system has to make you believe you are part of the system. How can they make you believe? They train you. They socialize you. So we call this is the process of socialization. Is that right? So you become part of you. So if you say you are a French, you identify yourself culturally similar to the practice of other French, right? Okay, because you, came, you come from France. If you identify yourself as a German, then you live from, from Germany, of course. It's quite straightforward. So cultural homogeneity is very important, okay? So let's see this one. So we know nationalism requires cultural homogeneity, but if we say Nationalism imposes homogeneity is not quite right. Let me point, point out the causal effect relation for you. Let's say we have a two different issues. One is cultural. One is cultural homogeneity. Okay? The other one is nationalism. We know in terms of nationalism, we require people to have, to practice the so-called cultural homogeneism, right? But remember, it is not nationalism cause. It is not the nationalism 
cause cultural homogeneism. Instead, although they are related, they come out from something else, some, uh, something else. Basically, there is something here, something here, become the cause for these two matters. Homogeneity and the nationalism are both the products of something else. They just come along the, just they come along at the same time. So nationalism is not the cause for cultural homogeneity. Rather, there is another reason for this. It is rather that the homogeneity imposed by objective, inexorable imperative eventually appears on the surface in the form of the nationalism. So what is the inexorable in, in, uh, imperatives? There may be something over here something over here. And this basically is produced, is caused by industrialization. Industrialization make people think differently from those people who live in medieval age. They think differently. How to make themselves a better man. Okay, let's continue to. So basically, if we look at the slide, can we talk about the back going back to agrarian society? No way. The answer is very simple because it, agrarian society has been obsolete. Obsolete is out of the fashion, out of the date. No longer survivable nowadays. Okay, so let's move to the next one. So we moved ourselves from our, we already moved ourselves from agrarian society to industrial age, right? So basically, when we enter the so-called industrial age, we also witness, we also witness the emergence of state. Industrial society and the emergence of the states that ask us to pay tax and to join the military to defend the country, nationalism. Okay, so let's uh, continue the arguments here. Most of the mankind, most of the mankind enters the industrial age from the agrarian society. So you can look at here. We, have, we live in an agrarian society and because of the industrial revolution, we move ourselves to into the industrial age. Most of the mankind, okay, most. And of course, there are some exception. We, we agree to that. The tiny minority which enters in, it, it refers to uh, the industrial age. Direct from the pre-agrarian condition does not affect the argument. And the same points apply to it. Yes, it is true. Okay, so the social. We do have some tiny minority, they are exceptional, but it still does not violate the argument here. So the social organization of the agrarian society, however, is not at all favorable. Favorable to what? We know we move ourselves from agrarian society into the industrial age. And we also find out that the social organization of agrarian society is somewhat, somewhat contradictory to the interest of some factors. The first one is the nationalist principle. What, is, what does this mean? If you live in agrarian society, what would be the major concern that you would have? Well, you care about your family, right? Will you care about the king? <laughs> Who's that? Will you care about the other people living in a very far away village that just happened to live in the same state? Not quite, right? So, but nationalist principle asks you to belong, you, but you live in a green society, you care about your own family most of the time. So the first uh, contradiction. And the second one is the to the convergence of political and cultural units. A state, to become a state, first of all, they would, uh, they would uh, acquire all the people living in one state to belong, right? 
politically and uh, culturally, to become the so-called political and the cultural unit as one. But if you live in a country, you live in a agrarian society, you have no desire to join the family, <laughs> the big party, right? You would like to live as long as possible in your own village. Why do I need to go to the city? No way, right? You can, you have potato from the field. So there's no desire for you to join. If you have this kind of feeling to let me alone, and then the state, when the state tries very hard to advocate political and cultural unity, you have to converge together. Sorry, I don't want to join. Then this is another contradiction, right? And third one, to the homogeneity and the school transmitting nature of culture within, I within each political unit. The school under the state system will require you to accept the norms that are only acceptable by the state. And uh, you come from your own village, right? Your parents will tell you, would, already, would have already told you how to become a bad person. But now, the school system, they try very hard to transmit the state authorized ideology to you. You say, thank you very much, very much, but no. So basically, agrarian society is very, very not favorable by the nationalism at all. If there's a agrarian society over there, then the state cannot do too much to change its people to fit its need, right? Okay, but if we go back to the medieval Europe, here it, you have to put over here, it. There are two it here, right? It refers to the social organization of agrarian society. But if we go back, to look at medieval Europe, medieval Europe, right? So it does have some use. Let's say this. In medieval Europe, it, this kind of social organization of agrarian society generates political units. Actually, we do not deny agrarian society still can produce political units. Of course, they, they still can, right? Because one family, if they are, uh, let's see, the pirates uh, coming out from the sea, try to rob their family, one family will be not sufficient. We could have uh, help from several family, right? Several families, uh, maybe we could have the help from uh, several villages. So it doesn't matter where you, whether you talk about a, a group of families, a group of villages, well, to some extent, even under agrarian society, we still can have some kind of political units. Is that right? So a congregate of villages, actually, it can be a political unit. So it generates political units which are either smaller or much larger than cultural boundaries would indicate. So basically, even in agrarian society, we have a small political units or bigger political, uni political units, and those political units do not necessarily have only one kind of cultural practice inside themselves. They could have uh, many, many different kinds of, uh, of formation. Only, only, very occasionally by accident, it, again, social organization of agrarian society, produce a dynasty state which correspond more or less within a, la within a language or a culture and eventually happen to Europe's Atlantic seaboard. Okay, so this refers to England. <laughs> That's it. Just happened to have one case like this because of the, the island over there, right? So the expansion of the territory for the state is uh, only limited to the seashore. So we think there, okay, fine. So the fit was never closed. So remember, only occasionally, agrarian society can expand uh, to encompass, to include a group of people with one language and one culture. It's 
very, very seldom happen, only occasionally. Okay, so this field was never closed. Culture in agrarian society is much more pluralistic. Pluralistic means not only one. There are many different, multiple perspectives. You can have many, many different choices. Then it's empires. And generally much broader than a small participatory social unit. Okay, so this is what happened in, in the medieval Europe. So we do not say, remember, we do not say that agrarian society could not have political units. We could, yes, we could, but only smaller or larger, and even inside one large unit, political unit, you could also see the diversification of cultures and the different kinds of language used in one political unit, right? Sometimes, just like in England, we saw one language and one culture, but in, even inside England, we also witness a lot of different practice, right? So basically, basically, agrarian society can produce political units, but that kind of political units does not do, did not have the requirement for homogeneity. They can have their own cultural heterogeneity. They can practice different cultures. Okay. So let's talk about the age of industrialism as age of nationalism. Previously we talked about nationalism is not the cause. It's not the cause, right? It's not the cause for industrial age. Then what would be the cause for, n what, what let's talk about industrialism. We, don't, we do not talk about industrial society. Now we talk about industrialism. Ism, ISM refers to some sort of ideology or value system, right? So the age of industrialism as age of nationalism. So it seems we find out the equation here. If we want to talk about industrial nationalism, then we may need to know what the meaning of industrial industrialization to human beings. Okay. So all this being so, even though we have the political unit, units produced by agrarian society, then we have seen the age of transition to industrialism was bound, it just happened. According to our model, also to be an age of nationalism. So you can see, if we see that we have identified the age of industrialism, yes, it is also an age of nationalism. National reason refers to people having the strong desire to stay in the one state. But why do they want to do so? Because they moved, mankind moved from agrarian society into the age of industrialism. They have to count on industrialization to make a living, to make a better life. And this kind of strong desire to use the science and technology to better to improve their livelihood incur the strong motivation to join together. Okay, let's see how. So the transition, let's hear. Basically it's a period of turbulent readjustment in which either political boundaries or cultural ones, or both, were being modified. So if we moved from agrarian society and uh, move into the industrial society, we have to make a lot of changes, right? For example, you have to move from your home in the countryside and move yourself to get into the city and uh, work in the very unhuman on, on human conditions, factory, to make a living, to earn some money so you can pay the tax. <laughs> That's so strange, right? So remember, in agrarian society, you, you can just go to your own farm and to harvest your crops. But now, in order to pay tax, you have to go to the, you have to move away from home. Relocate yourself from countryside into the city. 
a very strange, unfamiliar, and cruel city, and they make money from the factory, and then wire money back to your dad, your mom, so that they can pay tax. So strange, right? <laughs> okay, but this is the reason. So this kind of change, by its very nature, is turbulent. Turbulent means chaotic, no peace. It must be very violent change adjustment, right? So as to satisfy the new nationalist imperative, why we need to change? Because we have to do this so that the national imperative require you to become the one will be satisfied, which now for the first time was, was making itself felt. So you moved from country to cities, from rural areas to away from your farm land and get into the city, you suddenly found out that the nationhood, the national mechanism is upon you, right? So when did you feel the needs of the nation or the oppression of the nation? It is the good time when you move into the city, when you move yourself to enjoy the industrialization then you start to feel the uh, pressure, the pressure coming out of from the state. Okay, and we talk about transitional violence, right? Over here, we talk about a period of turbulent readjustment. And this kind of transition is turbulent, so it must be violent. So let's look at why the transitional violence must be, the transition must be violent. There are several reasons. First one, let's look at the rulers. The rulers do not surrender territory gladly. <laughs> Come on, give me the land. Okay, fine. Accept. Accept my gift happily and willingly. No, no one wants to give up the lands, right? So the transition of the lands from one country to another country must be violent. And every change of a political boundary must make someone a loser. And not only a loser, someone, a lot of people just died, right? Be hated. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of people die. So wars happened and the conflict happened and the battles happened, and people just died. A lot of people died. Okay, in order to change the territory, people have to be died out. The original occupants have to be died out. You know, good old times, right? Okay, and the other one. This is about rulers' territory, and the other one is about your cultural practice, and now, because changing one's culture is very frequently the most painful experience. Do you really want to change your culture because you are now belong to another state? For example, uh, Japan had occupied Taiwan for 50 years. 50 years. When they first arrived in Taiwan, and uh, it was in 1980, 1989, yeah. 1989, when first arrived Taiwan, there were a lot of gun fighting and bloodshedding at that time. And they confiscated the social strata property from the local people and uh, the process is for violence. And they asked the Taiwanese to change their names to Japanese names. So change the culture, right? So basically, the changing one's culture is very frequently the most painful experience. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. And also, there are the third reasons over here. Because there were rival cultures struggling to capture the souls of men. Culture is not only one there. There are a lot of different cultures competing with each other. To get your, to get attract your attention, to say, hey, this is my mainstream, right? So just as they were 
the rival centers of political authority striving to suborn men and capture territory. Not only culture, but also there are many different kinds of authorities out there. They try to take you down and make you to become the subject subordinated to their own government. So the wars happen after that, then people will be relocated from one place to another place, right? And the most of the, in ancient time, when they were a war, they, there was a war, and then after the war, most of the male, most of the male above the age of 16 were slaughtered afterward, just killed. Fortunate for us, right? Fortunate for us, we do not experience this kind of cruel age. But at that time, it is because of the struggle for political power. So here, let's take a look. I have something to say. Given all this, we have all this discussion. We know the transition is violent because of the territory, because of the culture, because of the competing interest among the rulers, right? Okay, so given all of this, it immediately follows from our model that this period of transition was bound to be violent and conflict ridden. This period of transition refers to this period of transition, our transit ourselves from agrarian society to industrial society is violent <coughs> and conflict ridden. And we know Actual historical facts fully confirm this kind of expectations. War is so cruel, cool, right? So today, let's, let's just simply compare the war between Russia and the Ukraine. You will instantly understand that. The, what's wrong to the people, civilians up there? But they were continuously bombarded by Russian missiles. What's wrong with them? Uh, just because they are so unlucky? Not quite. The reasons for doing that is very, very complicated. Okay, so we have to look at the big picture. Any kind of war is cruel, indeed. Okay, so let's have a 10 minutes break and uh, back again. Age of industrialization as age of nationalism. So when we move ourselves to industrial society, we would unavoidably to meet the challenge and the need, the emergence of nationalism. But here we have to emphasize, nationalism has become a new social form of industrialization. So now we, we have, a, oops, we have a industrialization, nationalism, right? So what is nationalism? National basically, it is a new social form come out from the industrialization. And based on the industrialization, we have one society for people eager to use the benefits, harvest the benefits of industrialization. So we call that is industrialism, right? So after we accept industrialism, then we get together to become, to form a new society. And the new society is based on nationalism. Okay, nevertheless, nevertheless, we have to argue, it refers to, if we say we just proceed by simply working out the implication of the, all the implementation of nationalist imperative for a greener society, this would, be, would not be correct. So why don't we just use nationalism, say we use this to national, nationalist imperative, requirement, all requirements, for the agrarian society, that would be great, right? But not correct. Let's talk about industrialization, industrial society. Industrial, industrial society by itself does not just arrive in front of us by holy God's words. <laughs> we call divine fiat, the order coming out from the God. Come on, you accept, and you will be good, you will be fine. No, it's not that. Industrial, industrial society, although it is uh, the next step coming out from the agrarian society, it, it is 
coming out from some causes. First of all, it was itself the fruit of developments within one particular agrarian society. See, we can see that this kind of industrial society, it does not, it did not just come out from nothing. Basically, it is the fruit from one kind of agrarian society, right? It still come out from an agrarian society. So it does not, it cannot sever the link between itself with the previous status of the society up there. And this kind of transition, developing from agrarian society to industrial society, we found out that these developments were not devoid of their own turbulence. It's very much, a lot of transition, a lot of violence, a lot of turbulence over there. And when it, again, it refers to industrial society, when industrial society then conquered the rest of the world, we had the agrarian society before, right? Then every society is under the agrarian rule have been changed into the industrial society. Then we say, when the industrial society conquered the rest of the world, everyone just come to the, the power of the industrialization. Then what happened? Neither this global globe global colonization, <laughs> everyone is become the same. And no, the abandonment of the empire. You want to move yourself into a uh, industrial society, then the seemingly old fashioned kings and queens must be absolutely, ab n not, not, not to say annihilated, but must be forsake, given away, right? <laughs> they, are, they are not on the date, they are not keep up to date. Okay, so neither this global colonization become one, the world becomes one, right? Or no, the abandonment of empire, the, the conquer, the relinquishment of the, those kings and queens, those kingdoms. By those who had been carried forward on the wave of industrial supremacy, but eventually lost their monopoly of it. Let's see this one. We talk about global, global colonization and the abandonment of the in empire. Why did they happen? They all happened because they use, they harvest the benefits of the industrialization. But eventually, they use it in the very beginning, but eventually they were taken away. They were taken away by industrialization. So strange, right? First of all, the king will use the uh, machines to, uh, for the benefits of themselves. But eventually, the greater in the power of the industrialization will force them to just get away, get away. And uh, all of this, all of this, we say, neither no was peaceful developments. Do you see the structure here? Neither this nor this was peaceful. So the global colonization and the abandonment of empire, both of them were not peaceful developments. They are full of conflicts, full of violence, okay? So what does that mean to us? All this means that in actual history, the effects of nationalism can be conflicted with the other consequences of the industrialization, industrialism, which means that conflicted means a mixed together. We have to consider another factor. So if we want to discuss nationalism, we have to combine the thoughts with the, the so-called industrialism. So though industrialism is indeed an effect of industrial social organization. It refers to nationalism. What? Which one? This one? Oh, uh, because the, in the original list, there is no was, so as I put a was here. No, no. Neither 
no abandonment or empire is a singular noun. When you use neither nor, you follow the last subject, and this is singular. So was neither nor. Okay, either or, neither nor. You use the verb to follow the last subject. Oh. Okay, no, it's okay. Abandonment was peaceful developments. For example, he he is the owner of ten houses. That we find too, right? Because the verb always follows the subject, but not the subject complement. Yes, yes. Neither you or I am. The same. Neither you or I am means that the verb has to follow the next subject. Am, not are. <laughs> no? Okay. Okay, let, let me write this for you. Let me focus, let, let's uh, focus on this sentence. M, right. It's okay. Or, or this, neither you or I are, because we have only refers to this, us, right? But remember, subject complements, when we determine the use of the verb, we do not consider the plural, whether it is plural of the singular for the subject complement. We only consider the subject. Subject. So here the subject is abandonment. Here, right? Abandonment is singular, so you have to use was. Hmm? Was peaceful development means that it refers to a collective sense, we just, uh, we talk about this is peaceful. If you really want to talk about uh, peaceful, because, let's see this one, the abandonment of empire can refer to many, many different kinds. the collective empire has been abandoned. So abandonment is a collective noun. So there are many different kinds of abandonment over there, right? So abandonment of empire was peaceful development. I don't see anything wrong over there. No, I don't. Okay. Then let's move to here. So, though nationalism is indeed the effect of industrial social organization, it, nationalism, is not the only effect of the imposition of the new social form. It is not. And hence, it is necessary. It now refers to this entangle it refers to nationalism. To distangle nationalism from those other development. And this is necessary. So sometimes in this article, there are a lot of it out there. So you would like to uh, retrieve the PPT file by yourself and try to identify the reference of the it for different passages. So I specific highlight here, just give you an idea. It refers to different things. Okay, let's move to the next. So Christian Reformation, we talk about two different Reformation over there. One is Christian Reformation, and the other one is Islamic Reformation for modern Arab nationalism. So basically nationalism is a kind of reformation of your own spiritual status into a new age. So here we talk about the problem. It's illustrated by the fascinating relationship between the Reformation and the nationalism. Okay, let's say on Reformation, what is Reformation? Reformation means that you have to change yourself to fit into the new world order. Okay, here. Reformation. The straits of the Reformation from the Christianity 
is on literacy and scripturalism. Okay, and then we have to talk a little bit about the understanding, how to understand the Bible. For Catholic, for Catholic, the explanation, the preach of the Bible are done by the priests. So they explain the context of the Bible to their disciples. But Reformation emphasized on another issue. They believe that people can learn to read the Bible. So they emphasize on literacy. They got to read, they got to learn, learn to read words. And because they have, they have the ability to read the Bible by themselves, right? So they believe the teaching, the orthodox, the doctrine coming out from the Bible should be based on the script, based on the Bible, but not based upon the explanation made by the priests. So we have seen the movement of the Reformation. So in another way, there's a term we call Protestantism. Protestantism means that the different approach taken again, fight, trying to fight against with the Catholic. Okay, so basically the difference between the Catholic and uh, the so-called Protestantism, the difference is who has the right to study Bible, to explain Bible. That's it, very simple, right? Okay, so basic reformation, they emphasize on literacy and the scripturalism. And uh, it refers to reformation, attack of, uh, on a monopolistic priesthood. What is the monopolistic? Mono means one. Mono means one, okay? And uh, P policy, P O L. P-O-L means city. So if you have, uh, I'm sorry, P-O-L-Y means many. P-O-L-Y means many. And the one for many means that you have the full control of the many different issues. We call monopoly. Du mai, zhuan mai, right? So monopolistic means that you have one controlling power, dominant power over something. So they attack the monopolistic priesthood. You cannot use your words to understand the Bible, right? So you have to let the disciples to understand the Bible by their own, um, their own letters. So at all as Weber clearly saw, it's univer universalization rather than abolition of priesthood. That is, actually reformation, the people from this group do not try to abolish priesthood. They want all disciples to become priests, capable of understanding, explaining the Bible by themselves. So it is called a universalization. Make all the people become the, peop become the priests who can understand the Bible. Okay, and uh, it's Reformation is individualism and links with mobile urban population. Why there is a movement for reformation? Why? Because people move because of the industrialization. People had to move themselves into the city, right? So they had to get away from their old congregation, their old church. They have to move themselves into a new city and they find the new place for them to worship. In the new city, new location, they may not have the luxury to have the old priest to explain the Bible for them. So in order to know more about the Bible, they have to learn to read. After they have learned to read, they studied the Bible and then eventually some of them have found there is a huge discrepancy between the explanation from the priest and the meaning of the script from the Bible. So they start to believe that they can understand the meaning of the Bible by themselves.
Okay. So all make it all of this. This kind of needs three things: the stress of、um, literacy and its attack on priesthood, and、uh, because of the individualism and link with the mobile urban population. All of this, the three different factors make reformation, reformation, a kind of harbingers of social features, and the attitudes which, according to a model. Produce the nationalist age, because all of this attract people to get together, attract people to think differently, attract people to try to understand the Bible by themselves, right? So they feel renewed to some sense, and because they have to live in the city, so they have to calm down the new structure, but not their old family linkage. So this kind of new structure. Move themselves to move into the so-called nationalist age, okay? And the role of the protestantism in helping to bring out about the industrial world. So let's see the linkage with this one. If you want to understand the Bible, you have to read, right? You have to read because you are able to read. And so this group of the people, Protestants, they become capable of reading. After they can read, they learn how to harvest the benefit out from the industrialization, right? So they were brought. They are able to bring a lot of new knowledge into the industrial world. And this, this is a very huge topic. How much they have brought in the new. Brought into the new industrial age, and what kind of contribution contribution they have done to our human history? Actually, it is a enormous, complex, and contentious topic. People from different religion may have different thoughts about this, so that's why we say it is very contentious and a full of conflict by its nature. And、uh, because of this. We believe that it is not much point to doing more than cursory alluding to it here. So let's just mention it a bit. That will be good enough, right? Okay. But even so, even so, although we do not go deeper to discuss the philosophical debate between the Protestants and the Catholic, or we do not. Go deeper to discuss the contribution that Protestants have brought up to our human history, modern modernity today. But in part of the group, we still have some kind of understanding in which both industrialism and nationalism came later and under external impact. The full relationship of Protestant type attitudes and nationalism is yet to properly explore. The importance of Protestants, their emphasis on literacy, is very important. It opened the door for all the human beings to understand the world by themselves, and because of the knowledge after their learning, they are capable of exploring, expanding the potential of the industrialization. So this is huge, but we do not discuss here because it's too huge. For debate and for conflict, so here is the Christian Reformation for nationalism. Let's move to discuss Islamic Reformation for modern Arab nationalism. So let's look here. It's a、uh, the relationship between reform and the nationalism in terms of Christian world Christianity. It's a、uh, it's profound enough. But if we want, if we want to identify the relationship between reformation and the nationalism, it will be more obvious if we observe, observe the Islamic world. So this kind of relation is perhaps the most conspicuous. Conspicuous means obvious. Let's say this one: "Con" means together. Speak, L S P I C or S P E C T. Refers to eyesight, so it is very easy. You can see it. So conspicuous means obvious in Islam. 
So let's see what happened to Islamic world. The cultural history of, Arab, of the Arab world and of many other Muslim lands during the past hundred years is largely the story of the advance of victory of reformism. Reformism is the Islamic version of reformation, reformism. So this is a kind of Islamic protectionism with they have their emphasis. Let's see what kind of emphasis. First, a heavy stress on scripturalism. It's very similar to Christian Reformation, right? And, uh, but because you need to understand the meaning of the Bible, you have to learn to read. So since now they emphasize on the how to understand the Quran, so this is a heavy stretch on scripture. And above all, above all, other than that, the kind of Islamic protestism has a very sustained hostility to two different things. One, to the so-called spiritual brokerage. Well, this is the version, if we look at the Christian, for Christians, this is priests. They are the brokerage, spiritual brokerage between God and man, right? So they are, to some extent, they are the brokers for God to deliver the Bible. And in the Islamic world, they have very strong hatred, hostility toward the brokers between sin and to the local middleman between man and God. So look here. Sustain hostility to the spiritual brokerage and to the local middleman between man and God. They do not want other people to decipher the mystery of the Quran to them. They want to read it by themselves. Okay? And in practice, between diverse group of men, <laughs> and uh, who had become so very prominent in pre-modern Islam. So let's see this one. Islam, people in Islamic world, they grew a strong desire to read the scriptures by themselves. Just like the Christian in the middle, uh, in, in, under the, the influence of protectionism. Okay? The history of this kind of movement and that of modern Arab and other nationalism can hardly be separate from each other. So we have a see the movement of the Arab world based on reformism and the movement of the modern world based on technology, they have the nationalism. Basically, it's very difficult to separate these two, reformism and nationalism. They come one by one. They just get together. So let's look here, Islam. Islam always had an inbuilt proclivity, means inclination, or potential for this kind of reform the version of the face. They always love to have this. They always doubt the brokers. They always doubt the ability of the middleman to bring the real teaching of the God, Allah, to them. So had it been seduced away from it, it refers to an inbuilt proclivity of potential for this kind of reform version of faith, and had been steered away from it presumably only by this. Social need of autonomous ruler, autonomous ruler group. What is autonomous? Autonomous is, refers to ruling by yourself. Let's talk about this. Ruling by yourself, auto. Auto refers to self. Auto is self, right? This auto. And the N-O-M, norm, or O-N-Y-M, is to name. Name. Or you can take two of it. So you can name yourself autonomous of naming yourself refers to that you can name your own rulers, you can name your own re regulations. So autonomous refers to the ability to rule yourself, okay? So 
by the social need of ruling yourself by the rural groups for the incarnated personalized location. Incarnated refers to they need to have a solid concrete uh, concrete place for them to get in person to for worship. Sanctivity is the place for worship, which is invariable for social mediation purposes. So basically, they need to have uh, some solid, concrete place for them to worship, and this is very important. And this uh, this group, why they become autonomous rural groups? Why? Because. In Arabic words, there are a lot of deserts, right? So there are a lot of road nomads. They wander around the different parts of the desert. It would be very difficult for them to have a fixed place for worship because they always wander around. They always, always wander around. So they do need, this group of the all together have the social need to have a concrete sanctity whenever they need for worship. Okay, so under modern conditions, under modern condition, its capacity refers to Islam. Its capacity to be a more abstract face, presiding an anonymous community of equal believers, we could reassert itself. It means that under modern conditions, it refers to that. Even in Arabic world, they have uh, stepped into the industrial world, right? And in this case, their face has to become more abstract, capable of being explained by different factors, factions, different factions. Different factions of believers could have the ability to explain the meaning of the structure by themselves. So in this regard, the interpretation of the Quran cannot be concreted, cannot, be, cannot have only one version. It has to be remain abstract. So I believe in the Allah, but what kind of exact belief you have, it should be allowed. So under this, capacity to, be a more, to become a more abstract face is a very important presiding over an anonymous community of equal believers. Everyone is about equal. So this is very important. So let's come back to take a look about the difference between agrarian society, industrial society, and national society. We have no way to go back to agrarian society, right? Because the fixed resources out there, we just condemn all people to die by starvation. So we move ourselves into industrialization. And remember, nationalism is not the preparing power for industrialization. Rather, rather it is the change of the minds of the people are living under the industrial society. Christian living under the industrial society started to appreciate the needs for knowing more knowledge. Because of this, they start to challenge, the challenge the priesthood, the monopoly controlled by those priests. They want to share the power to read the, and to interpret and to explain the meaning of the Bible. And because of this, they educate themselves to become more literate. And because they know more, so they would be able to have more benefits come out from the industrialization. So they get together, so henceforth the age of nationalism just emerge because they come together, right? And even in Arabic world, they have the same, the same mentality. They do not allow the middleman to broke all the knowledge coming up from Allah to them. They want to become their own thinkers. So this kind of trend make the another kind of nationalism for Arabic world. So basically, agrarian society has a violent transition into the industrial society. And people living in the industrial society, they started to think how to harvest the benefits come out from the industrial society. So gradually, 
the nature, the mentality to get together. And this kind of mentality to get together nowadays becomes a form of nationalism. Very simple. Okay, so let's move to uh, talk about etymology. Agrarian is refers to agriculture. So agro, agri, or agri refers to field. And we talk about homogeneity. Homo refers to same or man, right? For example, we people are homo sapien. Homo sapien, right? Sapien means wisdom. So we are wise people. And the other one, homo, refers to same, right? So homosexuality refers to uh, LGBT and so on, right? So indicate, indicate, we point out, because D-I-C is to say. So indicate refers to we say to something. So I, if I indicate, this indicates a very important sign. This says, right? If I indicate you to do something, which means I ask you to do something, D-I-C, D-I-C refers to say. So if we have a collection of saying everything in English, then we have an English dictionary, dictionary. A-R-Y refers to a collection. Collection of a book or a collection of the place, put it in one place. For example, library, L-I-B-R-A-R-Y, library. Why library is a library? Because lib, L-I-B-R-A, L-I-B-R refers to books. So it's a collection, a place to collect books, library. And if you look at Bible, B-I-B-L-E, why it is Bible? <coughs> because again, B-I-B-L-O, Bible, is also a book. So we say the Bible, the book, the only book in the whole world work. That's what we have used, is a capitalized word. And occasionally, occasionally come out from the up and the O and the C-S, CAS refers to cat or cast, so it is to fall. For example, uh, cascade. Cascade is a word come out from C A S C A D E. So actually, it has two, four, and a four, right? Four and a four, what does that mean? Cascade is a waterfall. Waterfall come out from the, <laughs> the mountain, a four and a four and a four and a four cascade. Okay, so you could just read it by yourself, and uh, there are a lot of there's a lot of new knowledge up there. And monopoly here, let's see, mono means one, poly means many. So monopoly means that you one controls all, controls many. You have the mana power. Okay. So let's uh, go to the next one. So now, last lesson we talk about the importance of knowing uh, timeline and action point, action point so you will be able to uh, use tenses mostly correctly, right? So let's see this one. The most important steps in the argument have now been made. So we now we have uh, have been made is the present perfect tense, right? So mankind is present tense, inversely committed to industrial society, and therefore society whose productive system is based on cumulative science and technology. This alone can sustain anything like the present and anticipate number of inhabitants of the planet and give them a prospect of kind of standard of living which now may now take for granted or aspires to take for granted. This is the argument. It is a truth, my argument. So I argue in the present tense, right? Okay, so how can we perceive the different action in the timeline? So this is the, what we have. 
So again, this is time nine, right? Past. This is this refers to the past, and this refers to the present, and this refers to the future. So the action sometimes is action point. Let's see this action point. First, we talk about present perfect tense, right? Which means that refers to present. It has been accomplished. So basically, this is the combination. We refer to now, but actually the action happened in the past. So have been made. The next one, mankind is committed. And the system is based. And also this alone can sustain and give and text and aspire. Do you see they are all in the present nine, right? So always keep in mind when we speak in English or when we write in English, the verb tenses they shift the different form. So we have to learn to get used to that. Then how can we if we if you sit down alone over there, you will know there are different tenses for the verb in English, right? But when you are asked to write out your actions, a lot of time you just misused your tenses. Why? Because when you write out your verb, you do not have the timeline, the sense for the timeline. So always remember, you put your action and refer your action to the proper segment of the timeline. Then that would be much easier for you to think what kind of verb you want to use. This is especially important for students whose native English, native language is not English. It's very important because in Taiwan we do not use the, the different formats of the verb to indicate time, right? But now you have to learn a little bit. Okay, so last week I taught you this and this week I have just taught you this again. I hope that in the future you can do that by yourself. If you practice this you will, you will have a better future for your English writing. <laughs> See, I'm using different verb tenses. Because when I say this, I always keep, keep in mind what is the action, what, what is the action's relations to the timeline. If it is in the future, in the past, I will be very careful about the choice of the verb tenses to myself. Uh, it's a matter of habit. You have to gradually learn to use that. If you are learning this, then you will become fine about using the English verb. There will be no problem for you in the future. Okay, so this is part of the tenses that you need to know. And again, uh, two weeks before the final examination, we have a specific worship for the purpose. So let's talk about assignment. So here, the first one is a very pretty series one because we say after industrialization, agrarian society is no longer an option for human being. So Ghana, the author, argues that restoration of such society would simply condemn the great majority of mankind to death. Do you agree with this, his viewpoint? Yeah? Huh? Go, hurry up. So do you agree with his viewpoints and uh, why? So basically, how to properly answer this question first? You have to take a side, agree or disagree. Next, you have to elaborate on your reasons. So this is the proper way of answering this essay question, right? First one, it's all right for you to not disagree. It's okay. It's all right for you to, to agree. Oh, it's also okay for you to say, oh, that depends. <laughs> that will be fine. So you have to make a claim first, and then elaborate on your reasons, okay? And uh, let's take a look, next one. Assignment number two. 
So what was the trans why was transition from agrarian society to industrial society bound to be violence and conflict ridden? Why? So if you can, I really want you to find identify a real case so that you can identify what have happened in regards to the issue of political and the cultural boundaries. So you need to use a case and focus on the political and the cultural boundaries and try to identify the shift of the boundaries and uh, had led to a lot of violence and conflicts among different factions of the people. Okay, so this is I meant to number two. And number three, I want you to describe your perception toward Islam in a 300 words essay. Well, uh, a lot of people, some people in Taiwan do not have a full comprehension of the Islamic world because they are very far away. So most of the information you may have come out from Western media and maybe full of prejudices, right? So I just want you to have a good time to just double check your own idea about this. Maybe good, maybe, good, maybe bad, or maybe just purely misleading by those media. So it's a good time to check on yourself, to give them a fair evaluation about them. They are just different, but they are not bad at all. I just give you an idea. People are different. People from different cultures are definitely different, right? So we have no ground to judge, hey, your cultural practice is bad. No, that is not right. But we can, even though we now may have some misperceptions, but we can try to learn and to appreciate, right? So, hmm? Sure, of course. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, there are a lot of misperceptions or perceptions out there, but it's all up to you. So remember, we are here to learn to appreciate cultural differences, but not to criticize. It's wrong. Well, if we criticize, we can criticize, but sometimes our criticisms are based on our perceptions, and maybe we have this kind of perception is coming out from misperception. You can criticize, of course. Yes. Oh, I mean, appreciate the differences. You appreciate not to appreciate. I would say I, I need to use comprehend the differences. We know there are differences. And that everyone's reactions to the differences are definitely different, right? So appreciate is not to like just to know, comprehend, okay? So far, are you good? So I would like you to uh, discuss with your team members so you can have a panel discussion before you can really produce your own writing by this. Okay, see ya. And thank you for coming for this thing.